Welcome. Today we're going to be looking at Sending Signals, a tune that really took a long time to come together because it had a lot of moving parts. It was a tune that I wanted to try to set a new level in my own production. I think the best way to put it would be that I'd been employing a lot of the same techniques for a long time. That's not really going to lend itself to creativity after a while because once you really get a good handle on all those techniques, they're not really going to inspire you the same way that they used to. This tune is different in a number of ways. Especially in the bass, the production elements were heavily, heavily resampled using this signal chain over here. And the limiting factor of, oh, I can't just go back and change what I thought was a good sound, but maybe I can just tweak this thing forever. You remove that ability to do so. What this means is that you have to work in a more of a committal atmosphere. This can have its ups and downs. Of course, not being able to adjust the patches can be a bit limiting, but basically if you want to recall, you can take a picture of the hardware, but even that, because these are dials, you're not necessarily going to be getting 100% the same tone, gear being non-linear and all that. It's best to just work within the constraints of, I'm going to work on this one tune, and then when it's done, I'll flip everything back and then continue on work with something else. So I really did have to switch into a mode where I'm just hyper focused on working on the one track. I don't normally work this way. Number two, this track I worked on both at my studio and at Anastasia studio. What's interesting there is that her computer is actually quite a bit noticeably faster than mine, but the studio setup isn't quite as intense, so you can't necessarily pick out every single little detail in the mix. Having the ability to just jump between studios meant that when I was done, I'd have to collapse it down such that it would actually open my, on my computer at home. But here, since the sound is better, it meant that I could dial in the mix more, even though there was less headroom for me to do technical stuff. That's where I think a lot of people who work on their laptops get a lot of inspiration just from the fact that they can go sit somewhere other than just at home. It can be really creatively invigorating to constantly be changing up your environment. We're social creatures. We need that kind of thing. And it made the job of Anastasia to, to write the vocals for this tune so much easier. I can come with a complete idea, take those vocals, okay, got the recording. Now they can be creatively interpreted because the way it was recorded is not the same as how it was in the track. So there was a bit of a process of, well, as the track evolves, so too with the vocals, but we can't just constantly keep retaking stuff. So the idea here was that rather than putting other projects aside, let's see if I can continue to adapt these vocals in a way that would really fit with the changes that were sort of coming on as a result of working on it more and more. We're just going to take a detailed look at the individual components of this tune and, and essentially I'll show you what went into making each layer what it is. Here is the session. It is a bit of a daunting number of tracks. I think it's exactly 200 if I'm not mistaken and a lot of those are just individual spot elements, you know, one effect or a couple of effects that I process the same way. But there isn't a lot of dead space in here, like there is genuinely something happening in each area, but you just can't necessarily have it all be in the same track at the same time. So I tried to keep things as organized as I possibly could here. Look, I, I know that there are people who have dealt with more than 200 tracks that feel like this is, you know, nothing, but th this is the first time I've ever gotten that high. I had to come up with a way to at least keep this relatively organized. And when you collapse it down, uh, it's actually, I would say, pretty readable. It's really just about organizing as you go. Nothing has to be super daunting if you're taking the time to make sure that what you're working on doesn't kind of get out of your control. So in other words, if things are getting messy, make sure you call back a little bit because here, I would say that this is pretty easy to understand what's going on. Things have at least kind of like a halfway sensible name to them more. There isn't such a huge jumble of different bass sounds that you couldn't navigate your way through it. So it's very important to try to keep organized if you can, because if you need to do revisions and stuff like that or bounce stems, oh man, you're gonna have a hard time with that. So basically anything in here that's muted was something that I resampled and then once it landed down here in one of these tracks, I didn't want it playing anymore. For example, I think this would be the main bass. Oh, oh, oh. 
Yeah, and as you can hear, there are actions in that bass that I never ended up actually using. But the main concept of the tune actually came from a preset from Strange's Gnarly Pack. So shout out to Stranger. Starting with bass wobble fuzzy sign. Messed with it, changed some of the parameters in terms of how it kind of drives and whatever, but I didn't go in there and can't do anything too, too surgical. He had sent along a copy of the pack going through it. I heard so many good sounds in there. And then I came across this in particular. I had to bookmark it because I knew I would use it later. And then sure enough, time came to write this tune for Anastasia. And I'm like, oh man, this, this sound is going to work for sure. And then if we go down here. So really what happened there is that it got a lot brighter. I trimmed down some specific harmonics within that patch just to get things sitting well in the mix, applied phase distortion and use multi-pass to basically widen up the top end because all the sampling happens in mono since I don't have a stereo pair of this stuff. So you have to either record it twice, which I mean you can do, but I find that for big systems and translating to say like the sound system event type of space, you're probably not gonna want to have too much stereo stuff happening in the super thick elements of your track. So ideally when you collapse stuff down to mono, it still kind of works for the most part. And every single element in this tune I checked for that type of thing and everything does collapse down to mono and using these sort of effects where you just apply a bit of a Haas effect to everything past two point whatever kilohertz because it's a very digital sound you're not really gonna hear any of the comb filtering that comes from something like that. And I just kind of turn the wide controls down and I can play it without that effect. So here's with it on. And if we get rid of the stereo control, All right, it's really wide, but it actually kind of gets a little overwhelming. So it's just important that anytime you do any processing like this, you kind of take it down to a reasonable level. And then that bass just sort of gets iterated on a bunch of times throughout the track using audio editing. It's really fun to just edit clips like that instead of working with MIDI, I find, because all the warping modes that you can apply are very musical sounding and kind of sometimes will give you really unexpected results. It's one of my favorite little sequences in there. And very simple, it's just auto filter. And then I just send it down to some reverb. Uh, I think this is just like a squashed uh, version of it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's just got some digital distortion on there from basically pitch shifting it up by one semitone. Uh, gives it kind of like a waxy sound, like if I turn that off. And then back in. Sometimes digital distortion is actually exactly what you need to make it fit in better, surprisingly enough. Made heavy use of phase plant for this uh, track as well. Here's one of the patches. All right, that might sound familiar as uh, it appears below, but this is sort of like an unfiltered version of it. It's just straight off phase plant. I was basically making really harsh sounding patches because they were just getting sent directly to the hardware. Basically, multipass was my friend here. I split up the sound into three bits, basically didn't do anything on the lows. In the mids, I had some reverb in there, and then this LFO up here is just controlling the disperser, filter, stereo widening, you know, that kind of thing. And I just like the kind of movement that that created. Again, we can play that uh, without uh, any of that stuff. <laughs> Right, it still sounds relatively the same, but it just adds a little bit of extra dimension to it. Small details can really, really make the whole thing just kind of more complete. So that's the resampled uh, version of this. So what we've got here is stomp box effect. Uh, Serum effects is awesome, by the way, for just layering in extra bits of effects. Uh, I got Faturator separately. This is just the kilohertz one that comes with face plant. This EQ just moves down and then there's a sub oscillator below it like that. Essentially, it, it just follows the bass. You can't really get away with this much EQ and still have the subs in it. You do need to synthesize the low end again somewhere else. And really nothing special as far as what I'm doing here. It's literally just a sine wave and a bit of tape saturation. Resynthesizing your low end actually is a trick that I picked up from Mephius. So shout out Mephius. Here's another patch that actually does play. And it's kind of like your typical 
noise FM bass thing. Yeah, it's basically just a lot of crazy harmonics with some different aliasing applied to them all in complicated ways that'll kind of bounce back and forth. Then a bit of Faturator and just a little bit of kind of corrective EQ just for good measure. Comb filtering is also an awesome way to add some texture to your sound because there's really only so much you can do with just FMing or AMing or, or whatever. Sometimes you need to add some really complicated harmonics in there for it to sound complete. We can kind of preview it even just without any of the multi-pass stuff going on. And then with this in. Yeah, it just kind of holds all the sounds together, but it's really great the fact that you can split the sounds in multi-pass. I'm a huge fan of that, and that's what's kept me coming back to phase plan is just this whole band splitting thing built into the plugin, like, wow, perfect. Here's another patch that plays. I think this is resampling. Right. So this is basically a resampled bass that was kind of like a noise patch above and then the same sort of thing of if you just play this on its own you could get away with that but i decided to just cut the low end on this and then do it up above and since there's all this crazy modulation going on it'd make the bass kind of flutter too much and it's just hard to get that all locked in if you've got like all this action and stuff happening in your track also pro tip eq8 only comes with a times four or a one pull high pass filter that can limit you quite a bit in terms of what sort of timbres you want to get because a one pull doesn't get rid of very much low end content like as you can see the curve of this is really different you can just turn on two high passes at the same time at essentially the same frequency and then you get what is effectively a 12 db filter it's a good balance between a lot of phase shift on your low end and just going full essentially brick wall with a minimum phase filter is going to make your bass ring too much so don't forget that you can have stacks of filters on top of each other you can't just limit yourself to having either tons of cut or only a little bit of cut it's good to be restrained but little stuff like that can really help your workflow a lot and there's all sorts of bases that happen in here like it seems like a lot the thing is is that this is spread out over so many sessions you just kind of keep the track on loop and you keep playing it and then you know you're just having a good time you're you're messing around and phase plan dialing stuff in and having fun with you know all your stuff and then just as long as you're recording all the time you'll you'll have your little nuggets that come here it's not like i just sat down and you know wrote all this bass at the same time like this this took forever to <laughs> to make this many different bases for it but i'm glad i spent the time because it just makes the track that much more varied yeah there, there's another one that kind of adds a lot of nice texture to it and yeah it's just an auto filter just a lot of boost in the mid partials, bit of compression on there, kind of tube style, very, very light. And then the Ozone 9 uh, exciter just to, well, add some excitement, I guess. The middle section has a bass that took a while and it sounds like this. This harmonic is getting filtered by this so that you're only hearing a certain part of it. And as it continues on, it has this super long envelope on it that slowly reveals more of the top end. It sounds really harsh without all the filtering on it, actually. Yeah, it doesn't even sound like the same thing. And that's just the bass, noise, and then that kind of dancing synth thing. This ramp control monitoring the phase distortion here is what kind of gives it that almost an arpeggiated sound. We kind of get rid of it. This is sort of kind of like a quasi Reese at that point. That's where it comes in right there is some phase distortion. So kind of an unusual use for this to turn the sound into an arp, but it worked perfectly. And then at the beginning, Just oscillator A, oscillator B, tons of unison, a super slight amount of FM from A, and then A is being FM from noise, and then just filtered as it goes along. Stuff doesn't have to be super complicated to sound good. And then this is that kind of rocking section with the alternate rhythms.
because it moves so much, I needed a lot of different modules to come in and out as the track uh, evolved. So I could spend probably a whole video and just this one patch alone but basically it was just a ton of experimentation with little micro variations of the same sound map this long envelope to all sorts of various parameters in here to keep it moving you can achieve a lot with a single patch if you're willing to put the time into putting all these intricate movements in into stuff and would it be easier with two or three patches i mean maybe but i like having it all under one roof where i can monitor what's going on with everything at any given time and if i don't like one particular aspect i'm not hunting between different patches to say okay well what what is this noise sound and how can i change it i might actually release this as just its own patch so people can kind of mess around with it this particular section took a while to just build out the proper bases and stuff because i didn't want it to just feel like oh well another breakdown just for djs i wanted this to really evolve and flow and to do something else in this tune with the exception of actual like played parts a lot of it i just took from sample packs i made some patches with various synthesizers here's one example of one that i made that was just another session of me feeding stuff into a cassette machine and just trying all sorts of different patterns until I found something that stuck. Filtered it with some automation so it wouldn't override too many of the frequencies as it came in. It might have been phase plant, but don't quote me on that. Here's another one. Is Syntronic in here. Syntronic's actually awesome, by the way. Amazing collection of super versatile retro synths. I love little hidden chords and progressions and stuff that can add like an extra dimension. This beginning section, I basically bashed around on the keyboard for a little while and then edited the MIDI by hand. And this was something it took a long time to dial in because I'm not a piano player at all. But Anastasia is an amazing pianist. So she hears little progression things in here that I thought it's like, well, whatever, right? It's just, it's a progression. I like the way that it ends. I'm like, well, it starts. I can't tell you why. She has a good ear for that and really helped me dial and correct this whole thing down to a point where it just felt right. Another Syntronic patch with this thing here called Honest Organ. I basically didn't tweak the patch at all. I just loaded it and EQ'd it just to fit within the bounds of the track. Without the EQ. This is a little bit too muffled. I really like the way that came out. This is what I had written originally, actually. It's like a combination of stuff that I drew in slash played. Basically, she just helped me tweak that performance down to, to the, really the core components and get the movements all correct. Lots of little sample work and manipulating stuff like this. It just sits in the background. It's not like a super foreground element. I love stuff like that, that adds texture to it. This was a great one for sure. That one just sealed the deal for me because without that little patch, you lose the tension. With it in, the 3D detail on that is just great. There's no shame in doing a combo of your own playing in sample packs because that's what they're there for. Basically just a filter action coming in to kind of breathe into the track sort of thing. And it's not any one particular layer that makes that section. It's the whole thing. If you just turn all of them off, it's not even the same thing. You change the course. Turn it back on. All 
them come together, they help to swell the track. And it's super important when you have breakdowns and stuff, especially if they're kind of like a non-linear progression that you have little things that you're not trying to stress too much in any particular order. You can only do so much with a pad. You do need other supporting pads to kind of bring them into a nice place. Oh, I didn't even talk about the bass bus. Without all this, the, the bass was just kind of a mess and would constantly hop between having too much bass or too little. And so all this stuff is doing is just looking for when the bass gets too hot. And spring it down. Because certain patches will activate the band some won't. It just helps seal the mix down. But because you don't want to apply the same EQ to everything, you have to have it respond dynamically and hence dynamic EQ. Little bus comp. Locks in the occasional little thing that kind of goes over. And then this master EQ plug in here, just kind of shaving off a few dB here and there to keep things you know exciting and, and crisp. And then what these are doing is tucking the energy above 190 hertz and below 15k. It will tuck those frequencies down every time the snare plays. It's just a side tune with a crossover in it. And then the kick, same idea, but then only below 115 hertz will it tuck those frequencies down to make more room for the kick. Simple. It works. I used to do this in Serum. It got a little bit too CPU heavy and had glitches. You wouldn't let the frequencies play unless you had a kick or a snare play first. The snare went through a lot of changes. It's just addictive drums, but having spent ages on all these little EQ and tonality control, exactly how much pitch to drop by when the snare hits and then how quickly it will recover, how much of the lows to cut and what ratio of certain things to play and like how much compression each element will get. This took pretty much the entire tunes worth of just kind of you open it up, tweak it a little bit, okay close it work for a little while more and then come back and just keep tweaking it i'm pretty happy with how it turned out but it was done over a lot of sessions because snares in particular because they're such a fundamental part of the genre you have to get them in a really good place this is how it sounds just isolated the individual elements sounds like this that's the fundamental and the overhead That's the actual like, kind of fizz to it, and then overall. And the EQs make them sound a lot different. You'll solo this for a while, tweak the parameters on solo. Oh, well, this actually works for this reason, but then it doesn't work for that, and then going back and forth. But this plugin in particular, Addictive Drums, is <laughs> it's a tweak head's paradise because you can get lost in this plugin for sure. I like it so much. It's an amazing plugin. Just be aware that this can be a bit of a time suck because working on drum sounds in particular, it's an important thing if you want your record to sound big and juicy, just be prepared to put the time into making it work. Hi-Hat was done in Addictive as well. Nothing crazy for processing here. It's just the, what is the minor Byzantine symbol. Basically just boosted the mids. A uh, little room, just cut the lows. It's a simple hi-hat, it works. I just wanted it on a pattern that kind of complemented the kick and snare elements. And then the kick drum is a mixture of synthetic and real. It's just beater tone mixed with a bottom end I made in phase plant. The beater tone off of a Ludwig Blue Oyster. And then the actual kick itself just comes from a square sign being distorted and filtered and stuff. It'll go back and forth between being having the beater tone from addictive and not, and it just gives it a little more life because if it's just the exact same kick sample over and over again, it can kind of get a little bit tiresome. And the percussion elements is just some experimenting with different samples and stuff. You'll try different stuff from different kits and then move them as you please. And then the percussion section is actually fairly sparse. Not until you get the kind of like uh, midsection here, but I can just play the percussion on its own. Really nothing going on in there. You got to make room for all the other elements. 
completely different sounding when you just add these three in. But that's all it needs to be. Strip things back. If it's a detail that doesn't need to be in the tune, cut it. That's actually the old snare, and I used it just for these transition sections. Not bad, but I wasn't liking how that sounded with the entire tune, so I just used it as kind of like an alternate. It's more of a marching band kind of sound, that's how I would describe that, and it got a little bit hard on the ears to listen to for four and a half minutes, so it worked better because it sticks out so much. It's just these little filler types of sections. And then the middle actually involves a little more of my own original work here, in particular the claps. Just kind of messing around with the MIDI and velocities and stuff, and then trying to see what samples could trigger it at what MIDI velocities, and then trying different combinations of the notes as they would play, some perk elements just to add some spice in there. I'd call it like Soka-ish. The actual drum processing is very simple. I just rolled off the super low frequencies in there so you wouldn't have any DC offset. And then just the T-Rax Neve EQ just to push things around in the right place. You know, it sounds okay, but... You can add a lot of color to stuff just using that plugin, which I love, but percussion is just a lot of experimenting to see what will stick. And then all sorts of little effects that have scattered throughout here. Yeah, this sort of stuff. Lots of 3D kind of movie Hollywood type of things. Having good effects is important because it adds a lot of variety and texture where otherwise you might be kind of missing something if it's not in there, especially in a section like this. Transitions are a ripe opportunity to do that. And these are the vocals after much, much moving around and editing because it was recorded with compression EQ. So I didn't really need to go in there and do anything too surgical. stock glue compressor because you know what it works and then just a little bit of eq to make it fit within the mix no boss processing and then just some very light harmony stuff here this was one harmony that we couldn't necessarily re-record because all the setup had changed and so I had to transpose it by hand to get the harmonies that I wanted. They just weren't working for the tune and so it was like okay well I mean we don't want to throw away this harmony necessarily. I can disable it actually. With some adjustments I felt like it just kind of complemented the track more to do this. And yes, you can hear the artifacting, but ultimately in the mix, ugh. Because ultimately you're listening to her lead part anyway, so whether or not it has a little bit of artifacting is not a big deal. I mean, the, this whole track has artifacting anywhere in it, and you're basically using it for creative effect. Artifacting's not always a bad thing. Just some reverb automations and stuff to send it to various delay plugins. Stock delay is awesome, by the way. Don't forget to use that because it's great. This one, yeah, stock delay. This one is the T-Rex Hall. This is an amazing plugin. I love everything about it. It's so adaptable and so usable. In stock reverb, and then reverb into delay, which is not the most orthodox way you could do it, but this is music after all. Rules can be a little bit flexible, and sometimes they really have to be. I really like doing this sort of stuff where you sample reverb and then reverse it to have it smoothly transition the vocals when they come back into the tune if they've been out for a second. I love having these little reverb things where you can basically just turn on beat mode where it'll skip every eighth note. It'll kind of cut it off into these envelopes automatically and then you're not having to cut the audio into these tiny little pieces like this. Oh, I want to get a start effect, better just slice this up into a million pieces. You can just use the beat warping mode and then change how long the window is on that. Like for example, if I just set it to almost nothing. 
kind of like a stutter effect or if it's super long, it doesn't do anything. You can kind of like think of these individual little cuts that it's making in the audio for you. Give you a really nice effect when you do that, and especially if you feed that end result of that stuttered reverb into another reverb or another delay. You can make these big, big cinematic finishes to your tracks. You can kind of have stuff bloom into place by resampling reverb. It works really well, actually. The master bus processing isn't exactly the same as I had it before. I do have another limiter after this to take care of inner sample peaks. I essentially mixed the whole tune into the limiter and this results in the track really falling apart when you take the limiter off. So it's with on, sounds normal, take it off. The drums are just way too loud. I'm a big advocate for mixing into the limiter if you're making loud music because it'll allow you to basically plan all of your mix elements correctly. It can be a really big challenge to go back and add the limiter to the master bus if you haven't planned the track to work into something like that. Even if it's just the Ableton stock limiter, you could just take a saturator followed by a limiter just to take off those little extra peaks because it's really helpful for you to have a perspective on what all of the elements are gonna do after they've been mastered. Yes, it's very CPU intensive and you can't play the keyboard necessarily while you have a limiter on. If you do want to be able to play saturator and stock limiter, that adds, I think, 1.5 milliseconds or something like that of latency and it would sound pretty close. It'll help take you up to the next level. Mixing into the target medium makes a lot of sense in the same way that if you're mixing to tape, you don't want to do a full mix in digital and then just dump that onto a tape, it's not going to work. You do want to be making changes and hearing it back as it lives and breathes with the tape because of the way you can mix into it. You can bring up certain things that weren't possible or were just really cumbersome to do in, in the digital domain. Same thing with the limiter. You can make certain mix decisions that wouldn't work any other way. The second section is basically just a lot more edits. These kinds of things. This is another cool little edit I just did by accident. I was just cutting up pieces of audio and then I heard. I was like, oof. Yeah, you'll have those little inspiration moments for sure. And auto filter makes this what it is because without it, it's very boring. It's just the same sound over and over, but this movement in here, you can do a lot with one static sound if you can at least move something. This is another one where it's basically just the same bass, but reversed into itself. And it kind of has this Calyx and TV thing going on. I think I was just reversing parts of the resampled bass and resampling those. And then I just happened to reverse one of the samples that had a reverb baked onto it. That just fell right into place. There was a breakdown in here. I think it's coming up right now. went through a lot of revisions. Just getting the right balance of all the elements is tough because an unexpected break like that can really mess with the flow of the tune if you don't do it well. That was just a lot of messing around with different timings and different MIDI notes and stuff. That's the actual raw patch. Kind of boring, but it excited it up with the hardware over here and the drums are Basically, the main snare mixed in with a couple breaks. In totality, the actual break itself. It just helped cap off the end of that bar, go into one more little section here and then fade out. Just kind of just tweaked this. That sound doesn't sound like much. And then two kicks, experimenting with one kick, two kick, like, ah, oh, how does this affect it? Just keep juggling around the energy and then you'll eventually be able to find little bursts of inspiration as you keep messing around with it. And even just little stuff like that, it just added that extra bit of momentum to it. A little tambourine hit in there. Who knows what kind of effect that had, but clearly when I was writing it, I thought that there needed to be a little tambourine hit right there to emphasize that last hit. <laughs> And yeah, I wouldn't change it. 
hard to recall exactly what happens in every little creative moment because sometimes you're just in the zone it's hours and hours in you finally hit this little moment and it's like oh yes this is exactly what i was looking for when you warp it, it changes the pitch, so it, it'll kind of create little melodies when you do that sometimes, or other times it just kind of sounds ugly. It just depends on the sample. A little conga action here, too. That is from a Loop Masters sample pack, and that particular one I actually edited. I came back to use it years and years later after having done that edit, but the original sample was actually from uh, Dubmatics, aka Jesse King, super talented guy, and he has a lot of really cool analog delay hardware. He had made that from a recording used his space echo and edited this down I was exploring some of these old packs and i'm like oh yeah uh i remember doing this as like a loop thing and then basically uh just dropped it into the tune because if you put all this time in editing stuff why not use it the beginning is just kind of a a sweet little ballad really the vocals shine there for a while i didn't want anything to get too congested here so it's just a lot of little funk kind of guitar samples and stuff and the drums are very sweet I just basically was just dropping samples in until I found the right ones that worked the pads area just to accentuate the voice. It's really the collection of all these little elements that make a complete sounding tune for me and detail work is really everything. It was a great time writing the tune. It took quite a considerable amount of time to put it together because I just wanted it to go in a lot of different directions and manage a lot of different influences that I've had over the years. Working with Anastasia is always amazing. She's super talented and I hope that any of you watching will check out huge catalog of stuff she's done with amazing artists. We're always recording stuff and ideas. I thought it was important that I show the other side of the production that went into making this particular tune and the rest of the album, it's good. It's super good. And it was extra, extra important to me that I gave my 100% effort for this tune because the other features on there are incredible. Thank you very much for watching. I appreciate you tuning in. This is a great time, a great process that came together over many, many weeks and I'm super happy with where it all went. So hope to see you guys soon. Appreciate you tuning in.